everybody. Two Alpha Gals here. I'm Debbie Nichols. And I'm Candace Mathis. And you're listening to In the Tall Grass, where we're sharing stories of reinvention, resilience, and rediscovering joy. Whether it's facing Alpha Gal Syndrome or any other redefining chapter of life, we all have to learn how to navigate the journey through the tall grass. So here we go. So as many of you might know, Debbie and I feel really strongly that taking care of our mental health is just as important as taking care of our physical health. So we know that living with alpha-gal syndrome or food allergies or chronic illness, it can take quite the toll on both of those aspects of your life. Um, And one part of that journey for me specifically has been to explore EMDR therapy to address some of the trauma that came with anaphylaxis and the severe reactions that entails. So we are super excited to welcome Quinn Padilla. Quinn has her master's in social work, and she specializes in EMDR therapy at her telehealth practice in Florida called Rella Wellness. So Quinn, thank you so much for being here. Thanks for having me. I'm particularly excited (laughs) to talk to you today because after seeing Candace's positive experience with EMDR, I have decided to try it for myself and I had my first session last week. So this is going to be really exciting to dive into. (laughs) Yeah, absolutely. Can you tell us a little bit about who you are before we really get into EMDR? Yeah, um, so I am a mental health therapist. Um, I work in... Florida. I have my own virtual private practice. So I specialize in EMDR and really any like trauma related issues. But I also work with like depression, anxiety, you know, the usual stuff too. I am a mom of three. Uh, My kids are 11, nine and seven. And uh, my husband's in the military and I'm I'm an avid crossfitter, even though I've been on a little bit of a a break right now. I've been a coach and athlete for about 15 years. So physical health is a big part of my life as well. That's great. Yeah. Yeah, We find that actually, you know, working on our physical health helps our mental health as well. (laughs) Yeah. 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 I bet you could really teach us about that, but can you tell us a little bit about what made you decide to start a career in the mental health space? Yeah. So from a very young age, I knew that I wanted to help people in some capacity that was kind of always part of like my core values and morals you know my grandfather who was a big part of my upbringing was just a very selfless man and he you know I always saw him helping people in just so many different ways like you know if he saw someone that was homeless, he would bring them food. And, you know, we would volunteer at like shelters and stuff like that. Even from like a really, really young age, like I would go with him to like the soup kitchen and serve food. And just kind of, he gave me like, I remember even we went on like a hunger strike. I know it was like we fasted oh, wow. for some cause. I can't remember what it was. Like, obviously I ate you know, food, but it was like, we fasted for like a certain like period of time or, you know, things like that. So he was just very passionate about serving and helping others. And then I found that like another one of my qualities as I got older was connecting with people. And so, you know, I got all the notes on my report card, like talks too much in class. Like that. <laughs> <laughs> that was like, you know, supposedly a flaw but you know to me it was like I was making connecting with people was always like my you know a strength and something of me like something for me that like came naturally and then I learned about what therapists did and who they were Um, and then so probably when I was like maybe in middle school I was like oh I want to be a I want to be a counselor for sure. Like that, I think I used to counselor instead of therapist. There's a slight difference, but you can use them interchangeably. Um, and then what kind of, you know, and I, I kind of, you know, growing up went through my own traumas and my own difficulties in life. Um, and then when I was 16, I was actually, I was assaulted and I, I went and saw a therapist and actually did EMDR. So this was like 20 years ago. Um, did EMDR myself after the incident. And I truly feel like without that, I probably would have 
developed some type of like PTSD, but I think because I was treated so quickly that I didn't, I didn't develop any like long-term issues from that specific like traumatic event. And so that's, that was, you know, like I said, 20 years ago, but already kind of knowing that was the path that I like wanted to go down. I think it's great that you found a tool that helped you. And so you know firsthand how it can help other people. Yeah, Yeah. definitely. And I think it's funny, you know, you talk about the report cards and talks too much in class. I think teachers should write like, (laughs) would make a good therapist, right? Like, you know, this to be a little bit more positive, right? Yeah, yeah. Makes connections with others, you know? (laughs) (laughs) I had the same stuff happening to me when I was, when I was in school, like (laughs) sat in the corner for talking too much. Like I like had to be sat in the corner. (laughs) Oh, I had to be separated 100%. Like had to definitely be like put away from, they would put me in the front corner. So I couldn't like, so I had to be right in front of the teacher. (laughs) Candace, they should have written, will make a great podcaster. <laughs> yeah. yeah. She's okay. conducting interviews right now. That's what she's doing. She's That's right. Interviews. That's right. So I'm super curious, Quinn, who, who led you to do EMDR after your assault at 16? I didn't learn about EMDR until much later in my life. So I think that's pretty profound that you were led to that at such a young age. Yeah, I think that it was I think I think that it was honestly a fluke because it hasn't even it's I feel like EMDR is just now like really emerging, like right. where people are like, whoa, this is really effective and like a good treatment. Um, and, you know, and it's been researched and studied like over so many years. And so I don't even I don't even know. I think I saw somebody right after I got out of the hospital. I saw a social worker and she referred me to somebody that was like, in my area. And I remember going to her, I don't even think I went a lot of time because sometimes depending on, you know, the process, it, it could take a really short amount of time or it could take longer depending on how complex the trauma is and all those different things. So I think it was like, I just, the right person was there at the right time. So that was, it was just kind of meant to be that like, I had this and yeah. You know, the universe was just like, oh, you know, you need this experience and this is going to serve you someday later in life. You don't know why, <laughs> but like yeah. it will. It's beautiful. So. It's beautiful. And I love that you, you know, had that option so soon after such a traumatic event. Can you share a little bit more about the specifics of EMDR for those that are listening and, and are wondering like, what in the world is this therapy? How is it different? Can you just share a little bit more about that and why it is so effective for trauma and PTSD and other types of anxiety? Yeah. So EMDR stands for eye movement desensitization and reprocessing, which I'm really glad that they shortened that down to an acronym because if I was like, oh, hi, I'm an eye movement desensitization and reprocessing therapist, people would be like, okay, get out of here. (laughs) So basically we, we don't quite understand the mechanisms of why the, the eye movement part of it helped to reprocess events. So that part is still kind of a mystery. Um, but the way that it works is you are reprocessing, you use bilateral stimulation, which means, which is the eye movement part. Okay. So bilateral stimulation means just both sides of the body. So you can use either eye movement. So people follow your hand or a light or something like that, or you can use tapping. So there's tactile bilateral stimulation. So you can tap on yourself or maybe your therapist will tap on you. And there's also auditory. So some clinicians have like music or sound that will kind of go right ear, left ear like that. And we use the bilateral stimulation and we target specific events and memories to help your brain reprocess traumatic events. So when trauma happens, your brain stores it as a feeling. So it's stored in your lower brain, basically. And when trauma becomes like dysfunctional, I guess I would say when it becomes uh, dysfunctional in your life is when you're not allowed to, when you're not able to connect your lower brain and those traumatic events to your upper brain, which is your logical brain. 
So for example, if you were in a traumatic car accident or something like that, and a trigger for you is getting in the car, you know, this is a car, you know, this is something that happens all the time. People have difficulty getting back in the car or maybe back on the highway after they have a, a, a bad accident or something like that. And it becomes dysfunctional when that person can't move forward with their daily life because the distress of getting in that car is so severe that, you know, that they can't, you know, kind of continue with, with their normal functioning. And so what's happening is they're not able to connect their, use their logical brain to come in and say, okay, you know, that was an accident. That was that's over with now, you are safe, you are, you know, you have your seatbelt on, you're in a safe vehicle, you know, the, the, the likelihood of it happening again is very low, you're going to be, you know, do all you have all these things that are all the logical thought, right, that'll help you to process is basically turned off because the trauma response and the trauma triggers are just firing so heavily that you in your in your lower brain that it like can't you, your your frontal brain can't turn on to logically process, right? So where EMDR comes in is we believe that something about the bilateral processing helps to connect the upper brain and the lower brain to create a connection. So that instead of next time, you know, after you do EMDR and you process that event and you get in the vehicle, you know, you might still remember, you know, you're, oh, I was in an accident and this is a little scary, but then you can make the connection with your, with your frontal, frontal brain and say, but I am safe now. You know, I, that accident was in the past and that's not happening right now. Now I am safe and I'm in this new situation. So that's kind of long story about kind of a little bit about how it works. And that was really interesting and helpful too, you know, because even yeah. having started it, I really didn't understand how it worked, especially mm -hmm. there are the different, different ways you can do it, whether it's the eyes or the, the tappers or tapping or mm -hmm. any of that. I'm wondering if you can talk to us a little bit about what, what exactly trauma is. When I think trauma, I'm thinking something really big, like a car accident, as you, you mm -hmm. mentioned, there must be a really wide range of trauma. Oh yeah, there's huge. So trauma is basically any extremely distressing event. And in the therapy world, you know, sometimes we call them big T and little T trauma. So we'll say, oh, this is a little T, but a little T can still feel like a big T. I mean, it really it can, you know, for example, somebody who's dad didn't show up at their graduation, you know, their dad could have been there forever and ever and ever, but they didn't show up at their graduation. And for them, that's traumatic. You know, it's all about that perception. And so I think it's really hard for us to, well, maybe not hard. It's, you can never really judge outwardly what somebody else might find traumatic. So for me, patients I see tell me things that I personally, I wouldn't find as traumatizing, but for them, it's extremely traumatizing. And so I think like giving room and space for that huge range of trauma is something that like really we all should be aware of. So. I think that's so important to know because I'm just thinking back through my own experience with EMDR. Um, my therapist actually worded it as a disturbing experience. So what was, you know, a disturbing memory and the things that started coming up from, you know, you use the car accident as an example. Well, I had a severe anaphylactic reaction in my car while I was driving and I was dealing with severe motion sickness that no one could explain to me had had all the tests, all the things. And I had a friend that had a really severe assault happen to her and she swore by EMDR. And I said, well, mm -hmm. if this healed, you know, her severe PTSD, like I should try it. And the things that started coming up for me I, that I like consciously could not have put my hand on until mm -hmm. I started doing this work. And then it was like coming up from my childhood. And I had an, an experience at the dentist that I would not have ever said that that was trauma, you know? So I think it is really important to, to kind of specify, I guess, that we all carry things with us, even if they're not these really, really intense experiences, you yeah. know? Um, the big T's. Yeah. Yeah. The big T's. yeah. Yeah. I agree. And so I say that I work with trauma because I think it is such a broad 
it's such a large blanket. Like trauma could mean, like you said, an incident where you were in the dentist chair and you were little and you didn't even remember, oh my gosh, I felt so scared. I felt so worried in that moment and not realizing that the stuff you were going through with your anaphylaxis, you know, was pinging on that same network from when you were a little kid, you know, like you're right back in that dentist chair feeling totally out of control and totally unsafe and you know all those different things so yeah it's definitely a hard place to be in you know especially after you've endured something like I guess we have with anaphylaxis you know specifically where you just you don't ever think that you would have this level of of anxiety and it Mm -hmm. comes out of nowhere so well and I'm wondering like I'm curious about how, so an EpiPen really puts you into fight or flight basically, right? Because you just are, is that what it feels like? I've never had an EpiPen before. So maybe you guys, you know, like, what does that feel like when you, when you, for me, I, I have the opposite feeling when I'm oh, okay. given an EpiPen. So I'm in like massive, I would say my reactions because they're my blood pressure dropping and I'm super lightheaded or it will make my heart rate go up really high. I feel like I'm in kind of that limbo of fight or flight. Mm-hmm. And when I actually am like receive epinephrine, I uh-huh. can- down. I don't know, Debbie, mm. if your situation was the same, but it was a very calming feeling for me. Okay. Mine was similar too, actually. And I think it was because there's so much fear associated with when your your whole body sort of reacting that way with the heart racing and the the swelling and the numbness and like, you know, everything that's telling you that you're approaching death, right? <laughs> yeah. Resolved. Trauma. We're talking about trauma. Yes. Yes. <laughs> yes. These are exactly. traumatic incidents. <laughs> but when I got, and I've only ever had to have an EpiPen one time, okay. but when I had it, I had the same thing. It was a sense of relief. Like, okay, I know everything's going to be okay now. Like I still felt like wired, but it was definitely accompanied by relief. Just knowing that there were professionals there and there was something that was being done that was going to take me out of this that I was in. That's good to know. That's not something yeah. I knew before <laughs> because my understanding of epinephrine as, you know, a hormone is that it sends, you know, that it's, it's associated with fight or flight is one of the hormones that I like. So, but that's kind of neat to know that you guys had that like release yeah, from it, it like... It's definitely, I don't know if it's normal. I mean, I'm, I call myself a unicorn, so I have no idea if anything that I experience is actually normal. (laughs) If other people, you know, I have heard it, it can send people into, um, having like a elevated heart rate. Mm -hmm. I didn't experience that because I was already having such an elevated heart rate prior to administering it. So I, Mm -hmm. I don't know. I would be curious to know what other people experience when they've had it, especially the people who do it repeatedly. And so they know what's coming when, you know, when they are about to experience it. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Absolutely. I have another question for you though. Quinn, um, can trauma accumulate? Like if you have, you know, a bunch of these little T's over and over and over again, can they become a big T? Yeah. So we call that complex trauma and that's when there's lots of different you know (laughs) t's big and little kind of all kind of culminated together and honestly that's like one of my favorite populations to work with Um, i love 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 working with complex trauma because it's really satisfying to i mean i love my job no matter what because i get to serve and help others like every day and help people to feel better. And, but with complex trauma, people tend to have more severe symptomology, you know, greater depression or anxiety or PTSD symptoms, stuff like that. And so being able to like see someone through that process and see the relief that they achieve on the other end is like so insanely rewarding. And I just, I love it. So that, yeah, our, our verbiage for that is complex trauma. And that's just kind of a blanket term for when they're, maybe childhood trauma associated with like abusive relationships and then accidents and you know if you're a veteran and then you throw a being a veteran on top of you know childhood trauma that could be considered like complex trauma stuff like that so does that then 
I guess that kind of dictates like how long the therapy would last for, right? Like I know Mm -hmm. I I didn't have a lot of these really, really intense traumatic episodes, but it still for me was about a year long process because Mm -hmm. I realized, I think I had a lot of little T's like, but not Mm -hmm. really, really big ones maybe. So, I mean, I guess it's just such a unique, unique situation for each person, right? Yeah. Yeah. It definitely depends. Somebody that has just an one acute incident, it might be maybe a couple months and then, you know, for others, it might be a longer process. So it just, and sometimes we take therapy breaks. So sometimes I have people that are like, okay, like we've done a lot of processing and I'm kind of tired and I need like, you know, a month off. And then we like revisit it, you know, kind of like take it in, in chunks if that's like necessary too. Do you sort of watch for that? Do you watch for when people start to get like, almost like they've had too much? Yeah, I more so like a lot of my clients like will just want to keep going like they most of them want to keep going but if they get too tired I guess like then you know we kind of take a break and and then come back but I think you know you asked earlier about like what's the you know what's different between EMDR and like why is it different from other therapies you know kind of thing is we I don't I think one of the biggest things that I love about it is that it doesn't focus on diagnosis so it doesn't like we're not like oh I'm diagnosing this patient and then I'm treating anxiety or I'm treating depression or, you know, like with different other, with different therapy modalities like CBT and DBT and things like that, they treat the diagnosis. And with EMDR, we're looking at it from a completely different framework. Like we look at where are your triggers? Like where are, where are things becoming disrupted in your life and why? And then let's process that. And what, and like my, I guess my, this is, this probably becomes before, you know, my thing about not treating the diagnosis, it's your brain doing the work. So I'm not just sitting down as a therapist and telling you, oh, you should, you know, you should, this and this and this is wrong in your life. And this and this and this is what you should do to fix it. Like that is not EMDR. It is your brain working to become more adaptive, reprocessing those traumatic events and using your own, you know, logic and, you know, prefrontal cortex to get through, you know, process and work through whatever you need to get through. And it's really, really cool. The stuff that people come up with the way that they need to heal personally. So it's all very personalized. That is so fascinating. (laughs) So for me, without getting too deep in the woods here, (laughs) I have a lot of night terrors and, Mm -hmm. and that's one of the things that I'm hoping to work through with EMDR, but even just having one session, I've discovered that all of a sudden I'm dreaming like very differently. And Mm -hmm. all these memories that I really hadn't thought about in a long time are suddenly populating my dreams and actually in kind of a positive way, like things that would have normally bothered me if I dwelled on them are showing up in these dreams and I'm actually okay with it. It's been really interesting. I mean, it's only been a couple of days, but it's been yeah. really interesting how fast that happened and kind of to what you're saying that it's your brain doing the work. Yeah. So one of the things we tell EMDR practitioners tell our, their clients after every processing session is processing may continue after our, your session and and that you might have increased dreams. That's like one of the, you know, biggest things that we tell people. And I think dreams are super fascinating. And you can also, I also like to work with dreams. So I will use dreams as target, especially if someone has like a, if it's a really, it's a, if it's a recurring dream or, you know, ones that are kind of similar or just ones that people are like, whoa, I have to talk, (laughs) you know, like they come and they're like, I have to talk about this. I love, love, love processing dreams. Dreams are so cool. I had the same thing happen, Debbie, in my sessions and I would try to write them down for my therapy. That's what I'm doing. Yeah. I would come back to her and I was having these reoccurring dreams that um, involved water. It was really Mm. crazy. I mean, it was really cool, but just to talk with her about that and kind of get her, you know, take on, on it. I don't know. Mm -hmm. Like once I really dove into not only that, but getting relief in so many other ways, like I didn't want to stop doing it because Mm -hmm. it was making such a positive impact. And I no longer have motion sickness and I accredit it. 100% to EMDR, which was just 
super cool. So what do you, what do you say to someone that might come to you and say, well, I haven't suffered trauma. So would EMDR be a good fit for that person? Yeah. So like I said before, like one of, one of the many things that I like about EMDR is that it doesn't focus on a diagnosis. So I don't need somebody, one, I think pathologizing all of mental stuff anyways is not a great part of where our society goes right now, you know? (laughs) Oh, you have depression. Well, no, your life is totally chaotic and you've gone through all of these things. Like you're not depressed. I mean, clinically, right? That's how we would define it. But that's not what's really going on. Like you're living in this environment and you haven't healed from all of the stuff that you've been through. And like, I think that there's, we've pathologized all of these things like anxiety being And I'm not discounting or invalidating like anybody else that, you know, struggles with mental illness because I'm not saying it's not real. I'm just saying like the way that we've framed it as, oh, well, there's just something wrong with your brain. (laughs) No, there's something wrong with your life and the things that you've been through. And we have to like, how do we sort that out? And I think that that's hopeful. Like, I think that that's just, that gives hope that you're not just broken. And I think, you know, that EMDR like really is rooted in that. So I forgot even what your question was. Oh, somebody that uh, somebody that comes to you and doesn't have trauma. Um, yes. So it, it really looks at like what areas of your life are, you know, where you're having problems. So maybe, for example, if you're having difficulties and this is another here's another EMDR story that I myself. So when we when we do EMDR training, um, we have to do it on each other. So we're basically like we practice, we learn on a real patient. So we have to use our own life events basically to, to work with each other. And one of the things that I chose to work on during my training was I was having, I was really triggered and, and it would get really upset when I would have these interactions with this specific person. They would make me feel really Every time I interacted with them, I felt so bad about myself. I felt the need to defend myself. I would just get in a total tizzy every time I interacted with, and I'm like, why am I letting this person kind of have so much control over me or, you know, I don't owe them anything, you know? And so I process, I process that. So it's little things like that, like difficulty in relationship or anxiety about a certain thing. Um, I came to discover, and this is where I love that it takes your brain wherever your brain needs to go. I came to discover that that person was pinging on a negative network from a way that I felt as a very young child um, in in a different situation. So they were like, they were doing one thing, but here I was back to little eight year old me feeling this really awful feeling. And so, but then being able to like process through that, I was like, oh. And so now I have these interactions with this person, like, I really just could care less. You know, <laughs> like they did, it just kind of rolls off. I still get a little upset. You know, it's not all gone, but I'm able to like let it roll off, you know? So it's good for everything. I mean, I work with people that having, you know, depression, anxiety, even people with one kind of like little niche that I like to work in is with athletes. So athletes who have gotten injured, like in the sport and are struggling with like getting back out on the field or, um, maybe that get really anxious before competition, being able to kind of like reset their, do a little mindset, you know, regroup and kind of get them mentally prepared for things. So it's even, I can even use it not for just like mental illness, but also for like optimization, you know, somebody who is like going into an interview and wants to do their best or wants to start their own business or a podcast or, you know, and they're like having imposter syndrome or something like that. You know, there's so many uses for it, I guess. That's really cool to know too. And it kind of makes me hopeful that yes, I'll be addressing like the big T's and the little T's and all that with my therapist, but also maybe some things that I didn't even know were really, were really bothering me. And I love the way you phrase that sort of pinging off a network. Yeah. That's, that's really mm-hmm. fascinating. And it, yeah. I mean, it's very optimistic. <laughs> yeah. And it's like, you don't really realize that. Like I didn't realize this deep connection, like what you were just saying, Debbie and Quinn of the, the network. It's like, I remember being in a session processing and I'm like, holy crap. <laughs> Like, why am I thinking about this one time when I was 
little when I'm trying to process this current situation, but then it's taking you back into something, like you said, that you just don't even realize. And I, I think that's why I get so passionate about sharing EMDR with people too, because you just might not know, like you might not know how, like what the root cause of a trigger might be. Right. Mm -hmm. So yeah, yeah, I agree. I mean, even for, even for things like, like I said, like relationship, I wish, you know, I was in a long marriage where things were like really difficult and it was hard for me to leave. And I almost wish I had somebody like in the army, like, why aren't you leaving? You know? And so it can be used for like so many different things to kind of uncover ways that you're stuck or, you know, things you're kind of getting hung up on and, you know, where all of that like comes from. It's really cool. It is really cool. It is really cool. Well, so for people who are living or dealing with trauma at home, and or even PTSD, is there something they can do at home to sort of help with P- PTSD or, or trauma? So I will say that PTSD, it's unlikely that it'll go away on its own. Um, it's a pretty, you know, big diagnosis. So I would say to seek treatment. EMDR isn't the only treatment out there for PTSD. And there are like so many other like therapy modalities. They have PMS, which is transcranial magnetic stimulation. They have the stellate ganglion block. They have ketamine treatment. They have psilocybin, which is mushrooms and like hallucinogenics that they're using. I mean, there is like this huge, vast array of treatments so that if one doesn't work, there's like 10 other, 10 dozen other treatments that are available. I would say the one thing that they could do or that they should have is hope because having PTSD is PTSD specifically, like if we're really talking about that, because that is a very chronic and can be really severe issue to, to struggle with. I, I think that the biggest thing that I could give is hope that there are treatments out there that will be effective and su- successful. And that even if you've tried, you know, 10 things, there's still a dozen more that are, that could, you know, that will work and be helpful. So I think like really seeking treatment is kind of the best, you know, avenue, sure. I'd say. Yeah. 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 I think that's good to broadcast too, you know, cause that's not a fact that I knew and I've been, you know, seeing a therapist for a long time. Not that I needed that exact dealing with PTSD necessarily, but I think that's really good for people to hear that there are lots of therapies. And if one doesn't work, you move on to the next. And, and like you mm-hmm. said, that that's very hopeful. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And I think it's important. It's one of the reasons why we wanted to bring you on Quinn, because we're such huge proponents of mental health. And that wasn't something necessarily that was spoken about when I was younger. And we just want to shed light on how beautiful seeking these modalities can be and how impactful it can be in your life and not to shy away from it. You know, there's, Mm -hmm. there's no there's really no shame around this. We all have our stuff, whether it's a big T or a little T, you know, like, yeah, I think everyone can benefit from speaking to someone else Mm -hmm. about whatever it is. And so I, you know, I'm just really appreciative that, that you've been willing to kind of dig into, into that more. So someone, if someone is interested in finding a therapist that practices EMDR, is there an easy way to go about doing that? Is there like a national registry? Mm -hmm. So kind of, I want to, I do want to step back because there are two recommendations that I want to make for at home things that you can do at home. Two of my favorite books that are wonderful about like trauma and then kind of like depression and anxiety also. Um, The first one is called Lost Connections. It's by Johan Hari. And he describes in his book, he really presents like how we how we pathologize mental illness and how it's really not that we're broken that we're disconnected from so many things in our society. One of those being like human connection. And so I would say that alongside with treatment, connecting with others and like building a community, having your tribe, having people around you that you have things in common with, that you work towards like a common goal together or whatever it is, if it's a a workout partner or another alpha gal, you know, like 
having that community is so, so, so important. Like we were not designed to be solitary creatures. And the way our society has been like set up has really been isolating. And then, you know, you had COVID on top of it and then it becomes even more isolating. And, you know, people think that they're getting interactions through social media, but it doesn't scratch the same itch. It doesn't feed the same deep-seated primal need that we have for personal connection. And so even if that means you have just one person in your life that you are connected to or, you know, because that's all the, that you have capacity for because some people have higher capacities for connections and other people have lower capacities for social connections. But I think like that is a huge, huge thing. And Johan talks about that in his book. Great, great book, Lost Connections. And the other book that I love, it's a classic. Any trauma therapist has probably read it like five or more times. Uh, It's called The Body Keeps the Score. I don't know if you guys have ever heard of it, um, but he talks about trauma and how it's stored in the body. He actually discusses EMDR in his book. It's an excellent, excellent book. I think every everybody should read it no matter what. And especially people like teachers, first responders, veterans, anybody work with trauma at all. Everybody should read it. And then your question about if somebody wants to look for an EMDR therapist, if they're in Florida, I'm available for anybody in Florida. Um, that's my plug. Um, so I do all virtual. I do all my work telehealth so I can see anyone in Florida. And then Emdria is an awesome website. So it's emdria.org and they list everybody. They are kind of the governing body for EMDR. So they list all of the EMDR certified clinicians in the United States. And so you can have like a good resource there for people. Certain insurance companies will list, you know, sometimes I think they might list uh, like different different therapists. Psychology Today is actually a good resource too because you can kind of put in your area and then what specialty you're looking for. So you can put like your zip code, EMDR for uh, depression or, you know, EMDR for, they probably don't have alpha gal syndrome on there, but <laughs> <laughs> maybe one day or for allergies for, yeah. you know, something like that. Like, yeah, sure. That is so helpful. Thank you so much. Yeah. We have one last question for you that we ask of all of our guests on the show. And so um, we're wondering because Candace and I find so much joy in music and that's something that we can't react to, right? Like it's a very safe source of joy for us. Is there a song that brings you joy either in this moment or for all time? Is there a song or an artist or something? Oof. I got to like pull up my Spotify. If Devin's listening, she knows that we both listen to like hardcore explicit rap music. Like we listen to, I'm in my minivan, like I drop the kids off at school and then like I'm bumping music hardcore. That's awesome. That's awesome. So that is, that is, that's that. I love, okay. I love, so I'm glad I pulled up my Spotify. I love musicals. So I will put on like musical playlists like Hamilton, um, Les Mis, a Jesus Christ Superstar, like even the classics. Like mm-hmm. I love to put them on um, even some like Disney musicals, like Moana's Disney musical soundtrack. Um, so any musical really is like Mamma Mia. Yes. I have been to that one way, recently. Yeah, musical soundtracks are probably like other than hardcore gangster rap. So <laughs> one extreme to the other. One extreme to the other. Like <laughs> right, but we're like that just is like we're these big we're these complex beings that are like we're all our own special kind of like individuals. Yeah. Um, I love yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah. Musicals are do you guys share your like what songs bring you joy do I get to re-ask that question <laughs> I think you're the first guest to ask us we talk about yeah. it often because yeah. you know, it changes right Candace, do you want to go first <laughs> is there one right now like it is it changes so there's it like, does change doesn't yeah. it do you know who I find a lot of joy in right now is and I also actually Candace and I talk about this it's it's a lot of rap from the 90s that we both <laughs> we really like you know like turning oh. up a little 
little baby super. Little <laughs> Tupac, yeah. yeah. But right now I've been listening to a lot of Imagine Dragons because it just gives me all the feelings mm. when I listen to it. I really mm-hmm. like that. Yeah. And yeah. That's my most recent playlist. So golly, this is so hard for me because I'm such a musical person. I, at this time of the year, I start to go back. Like I'm starting to want to put on the Charlie Brown themed station <laughs> on my Pandora. <laughs> so Stop. I, I will like Christmas music. I can't, Not I Christmas. don't even allow that. No, oh. look, no, there's a difference. So I, <sighs> this, I was starting to get like triggered. No, I no. was triggered there by like. <laughs> Not the Christmas. Christmas music. EMDR. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Not the Christmas version, but like if you just listen to like the Charlie Brown, like Vince Garardi, I can never say his last name, but I love jazz. Like I love mm. Dave Brubeck and those are kind of my everyday like stations that I listen to just because it brings me a lot of like comfort and I love like the French jazz station. So literally I was listening to Method Man last night <laughs> and then like jazz this morning I mean so I'm all over the place too so yeah but I don't know the change of the season I really love very comforting jazz music Mm, interesting yeah I don't know but yeah my son (laughs) my son I was talking to him on FaceTime yesterday and he said do I hear Charlie Brown like he thought it was the Christmas (laughs) station my kids are my kids are not allowed to (laughs) sing Christmas music I mean, until unless it is December, no, like we're not, it's not allowed until my kids will be like, King Bell. And I'm like, no. <laughs> so they think, but now my daughter, my oldest, is in chorus and they're already training for, so she actually has to sing like Christmas carols. And I'm like, go in your room, like, or go outside. Like, Close I can't. The door. Like, I want to sing it for you. And I'm like, I'll listen one time (laughs) I have to do the same thing though I we do it the day after Thanksgiving and you know what's funny our our favorite Christmas traditions is to watch National Lampoon's Christmas Vacation Mm. like we can my whole family like my husband and me and both our kids can recite the whole thing from start to finish and last year we watched it the night of Thanksgiving like after all everything had wrapped up and we're like it was on TV and we're like this is the perfect time to watch it. So we watch it like kicked off our Christmas season. Yeah. Yeah. After Thanksgiving, I shouldn't say first day of December. It's really start. We put all decorations up day after Thanksgiving like that right. when it, when it all happens. <laughs> so, yeah. I love it. I just love how it just shows we're all like the range, right? Yeah. Like we have, you, like Quinn was saying, we're all complex beings. That makes me love my like variety of playlists that much more, right? It's just mm-hmm. showing my complexity. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. We're all that we can be all the things. And especially like as women, not to go on like a total rant, but like we're, we're, we're being told, I think, and hopefully we're growing out of that because it's 2022, but like we're told we're like, you're supposed to be this, you're supposed to be a mom and a wife or you're a career woman or you're that, you know, like there's all these boxes. Right. And we're like, well, what if I kind of want to do like all the stuff? Like, what if I want to be a mom and stay home for a little bit, but also have my own business? And like, can I do all of that stuff too? You know, like, can I be strong and feminine? So I think like that just, you know, that makes me think about, you know, the way that we, we can be all of the things. I think that's a great message too. (laughs) I think we could like totally talk about all of that in another time. Yeah. (laughs) Connection. Oh my gosh. Like I'd love to dig into that even more too, because that's such huge. I mean, we're seeing that within our community of alpha gal that it's, it's so important to feel that connection. So We are so appreciative of your time. Thank you so much for joining us. And we will definitely have to do it again very soon. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you for joining us today on In the Tall Grass. Visit us at 2alphagals.com. That's T-W-O alphagals.com. Or you can find us on Instagram and Facebook at 2alphagals. If you enjoyed listening, please leave a review and help us grow this community. 
We're all faced with obstacles on our journey, whether it be food allergies or tick-borne diseases. You might outgrow the reactions, but you won't outgrow the person you become. Ticks suck, but life doesn't have to.